Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Fee. For those of you who don't know me, Fee Wynn from uh, the Student Life Center City office here on in the New College building. Um, and uh, I'll be moderating this panel discussion. Um, I was told that our, our two guests from the Global Health Fellows Program um, are running a little bit late, but they will be here. Um, I'm going, the format of today will be, I'm going to ask our panelists um, to introduce themselves. Um, and then I have a few questions um, that they'll answer. Um, and then we will open it up to your questions um, towards the end of the uh, discussion. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, we do have a microphone up here, so when you do ask questions, um, to use the microphone since we are recording this as well. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to our panelists. If you could introduce yourselves. Okay, I guess I'll go first. Um, my name is Laura Lechtenberg, and I will work full-time in research at Penn, and I'm getting my master's in public health there as well. Um, but I'm here today because I've been volunteering for the past five years with a group in Philly. It's called Explorers Sans Frontieres, or ESF for short. And, um, and we do, we're an all-volunteer group of professionals and students who do a lot of uh, public health outreach both in Philly and abroad in Haiti and in Senegal. And Steve Larson, I just chatted with you all, so you kind of get the flavor, I think. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, and our first question is really just, um, it speaks to the, the point of this panel discussion is, what opportunities uh, do you offer students um, who want to be involved in global health um, topics, issues, mm -hmm. concerns? Well, for our group, um, obviously the trips to Haiti and to Senegal are much more oriented to global health as opposed to the Philly uh, outreach opportunities. Um, so we send students and professionals, any volunteers essentially who want to come down to Haiti three times a year, working with uh, some doctors and nurses who are from Haiti who run a health clinic down there. Um, and we do kind of pop-up clinics all throughout this one neighborhood called Delmas in Port-au-Prince. Um, and then in Senegal, when, uh, when students go to Senegal, it's kind of more of a shadowing opportunity. They shadow physicians and nurses that we have a relationship with over in Chess, which is a smaller city in Senegal. Um, and then there's also an opportunity to do kind of more health education because we work very closely with two schools. One is the National School for the Blind and the other is more of a neighborhood middle school, high school. And we work closely with the English teachers there. We help them out with their classes. We um, help them run discussion groups and conversation groups so the kids who are studying English get a chance to converse with native speakers. And we use those opportunities to talk about and teach health topics as well. Thank you. Dr. Lars. Um, so about, as I indicated in the 90s, um, I sent lots of students down to colleagues in Central America in the, um, as, as the demand and the sophistication of you guys as students increased in the late 90s, early 2000, you know, much of it in response to um, Doctors Without Borders getting the Nobel Prize, much of it in response to Paul Farmer and his work in, Port, in uh, Haiti um, and Partners in Health. Students started showing up on the landscape with more and more sophisticated ideas. And in fact, at that period in time, you found um, global health as a terminology being applied. It used to be called international medicine um, in the 90s, hence International Health Medical Education Consortium, IMEC, changed their name to GHEC in response to those student demands. And what was interesting is the before arriving in at least medical school, student experiences had been pretty sophisticated, you know, getting abroad on medical missions and helping translate on a variety of different venues. And so for me, the, the need to do that um, be, became less in a way, um, as Penn also created, like you guys have a formal office to sort of oversee and aid in, in that. Um, and, so, and so that office has taken on the, the task or the challenge of placing students, and they can place them in areas where faculty have research interests, a lot of them in uh, China, you know, developing uh, industries and economies like China and India have a, 
academic centers have a fascination with those, so that's one place that you'll find uh, opportunities for global health. And then in areas where, um, you know, disaster, like in Haiti, and um, and the demand is high, you'll find uh, programs and, and relationships. And it's pretty much driven in many ways by faculty. So for me as a faculty member, I'm one of many that has opportunities for students. And, and as I indicated in the slide, I've, I've kind of rethought that whole process. So um, oftentimes if a student comes to me and wants to go abroad, I'll have a heart to heart with them and um, try to help them think it through. So I can pretty much put them anywhere, but um, it, it really, we want people to understand the, you know, the environment they're going uh, into and cater it to their uh, public health experience mm -hmm. versus, mm -hmm. you know, medicine versus nursing, make that happen. Um, just to add to that, I know that with um, the demanding schedules of being um, a student here in health sciences, um, uh, you talked about your um, organization, Puentes de Salud, mm -hmm. um, and how people can still get involved in global health um, just here. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Because I know we have some new people. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we use the delivery of health care, um, and it's in a fairly restricted access venue at the moment. It's only open two evenings a week for adult and children's acute and chronic care, and then um, our obstetrics and gynecology, which is an all-day Tuesday event down at Pennsylvania Hospital. But the, the practice of clinical medicine is really that much of what Puentes is about. We use medicine and medical care as the kind of hook that brings the community, and you gain trust, and you gain a presence and visibility, but we flipped it over to sort of explode other programs that, you know, as Michael Marmot and, and people thinking along the lines of social determinants of health, I think rightfully have it, are going to impact that community in a more sustainable, long-term kind of effect. And so, you know, I mentioned having a child end up in my ER either with an unwanted pregnancy or a complication from an STI, like a tubal pregnancy that could be life-threatening or fertility-threatening or having a young kid come in with a, you know, a penetrating gunshot wound to the chest. And, you know, rather than wait for that to come through my doors in an ER manner, um, this guy Sun Tzu, the Chinese Taoist general 2,000 years ago, he wrote a book on confrontation and battle and how to wage it and win it. And one of his basic tenets is the best battle is one that's never fought. And so as a healthcare provider, if you think about that, it's better that that kid doesn't come to my ER, and I'm not saying he has to go to Jefferson or Hahnemann. I, I mean, it's better that that never happened, right? So if I'm really gonna be a healthcare provider worried about the community, then it's not waiting for that kid to come through the doors. It's taking the battle out into the community. And what does that mean? You have to now step back and say, how does it that a 15-year-old kid gets shot in the chest? Or a 15-year-old girl has an unwanted pregnancy that's complicated by an STI? Well, a lot of it is about education and about empowerment at an early age. And so rather than fight the battle here, take it out into the community. And so that's what Puentes does. And we do it in many different venues. We have a women's support group. We run an after-school program. You know, when you think about it, a child who's born into poverty, how are they going to escape poverty, right? A child who's born in poverty in the city of Philadelphia is by default engaged in a school system in decay that has essentially failed, right? Um, where you stand, what, a 50% chance of, of graduating high school if you're African American or Latino? And of those, what, 30% are competent at math and English skills? What future does that individual have? Just simple terms, right? If you look at the community of Puentes, you have a child who's more than likely born here to parents who are immigrants, who don't speak English, have less than six years of formal education, how's that kid gonna go home with any homework to sit down at a table and get it done, right? So the cycle just keeps perpetuating. What we try to do, and this is where opportunities, if you really wanna roll up your sleeves and, and make a community healthy, is to engage the community on their terms in, in ways leveraging them so that they can. Parents would love to have kids learn how to read. 
they can't do it. So being there as part of the community, sitting down with a kid and reading a book, sitting down with a kid after school and helping them to do their homework, to navigate the math, navigate the reading, encourage them and mentor them, advocate for them. Um, that's what you guys can do, and that's, those are the uh, programs we offer. Um, yeah, we offer the healthcare piece of it, and we have volunteers up the wazoo there, but that's not, if you're really in the next generation of healthcare providers in this country who are becoming articulate about social determinants of health, that's where you want the experience. And it doesn't take a lot of time, and it doesn't take a lot of effort or money. It is showing up, right? So that's what we do. And if people are interested, we have a variety of different programs. Um, we have promotoras who go out into the community and talk about nutrition and domestic violence and diabetes, and we partner them with students. And so they're great opportunities for, you know, literally, as I indicated with the painting, going out into the field to paint. And over time, you begin to understand the dynamics and the subtleties and the ways that you can leverage your interests, your resources, to make it a better community. So that's a lot of talking. Sorry. Um, and I just wanted to bring your attention to two individuals um, from Global Health, the Global Health Fellows Program. Um, if you wouldn't mind maybe introducing yourself and welcome, and then I'll have you speak with, uh, on the topic. Sure. Uh, Got to get used to this. Here we go. Uh, my name is Kendall Snyder. I'm the Recruitment Participant Support Coordinator for the Global Health Fellows Program. Uh, I do want to apologize for being late. Do not travel Amtrak today. It's a really bad day to do that. Um, so yeah, um, I like I said, I work for the Global Health Fellows Program. Uh, I help coordinate our internship program. Um, I've been with them for about two years. And then I am here with my colleague, Salam, who actually is currently an intern with us. So we're going to tag team a little bit on some of the questions. We have different uh, perspectives on different things. So, uh, Salam. Okay. Oh. So, good morning, everybody. My name is Salam Desta. I'm a GHFP2 intern working, can everyone hear me? Okay. With the United States Agency for International Vo Development, USAID, in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm working with the Office of Population and Reproductive Health in the Research Utilization Division, and um, I'm currently a student at the John Hopkins School. Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore, studying reproductive and women's health. And like Kendall said, we're just going to bounce back. He's going to talk more about the experience of getting the internship and what Global Health Fellows does. And I'll talk about more the internship and student experience of being a Global Health Fellow intern. That sounds great. Um, actually, the, our first question was, um, what type of opportunities do you have available for students who are interested um, in global health issues? Sure. So, um, Global Health Fellows Program, we, as Salam mentioned, we work with USAID, the Agency for International Development. Um, so it's, we are a cooperative agreement with AID. So, we support about 110 fellows and on any given year, anywhere between 25 and 35 interns directly through our um, internship and fellowship programs. Um, so, am I, I'm speaking loud enough, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, uh, the opportunities that we offer are for um, either current, for our internships, they're for, they range, they're open to anybody, whether you're an undergrad all the way up to, we have some PhD track internships. Um, we tend to have a lot of uh, either recent graduates of a master's program or current students, um, but they definitely are open to a wide array. Uh, the type of work that our interns and fellows do is all technical assistance type of work. Um, so whether it's research, uh, research on a, a white paper, um, providing policy analysis, uh, monitoring and evaluation, those sorts of technical assistance um, as far as like evaluating or, or um, developing policies uh, for international global health. Um, we don't see a lot of um, field work, like actually in the ground. Now, while most of our interns, about half of them will have the chance to go in the field to work internationally, all of the positions are based at USAID, USAID in Washington. Um, so we just find that they're a great opportunity for people to get that that real strong international development experience, um, especially if it, or especially working with federal government agency. So anyway, th those are kind of the opportunities that we offer. The mainly summer opportunities. Uh, we also have some what we refer to as on-demand, um, which are non-summer. So there's no, there's not like a winter cohort or a fall cohort, but we do have the on-demands, which are basically ad hoc positions that come up. Great. 
Thank you. Um, and I know Dr. Larson had spoke about this during his keynote, um, but for our panelists, um, perhaps you can talk a little bit about your own uh, global health experience, um, your professional and even personal journey um, into this area. Oh, no, we have both. We have plenty of time. Okay. Um, so I, I have a kind of a hodgepodge background. And I to say this to say that the recruitment uh, people at GHF people, Kendall can talk about this, but I'm, there's no one typical intern. So my experience is not reflective of what they're looking for per se in, in one candidate. I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'll just share my experience, but it's not, you know, they look for a wide range of people and not just public health, um, students of public health, but there were students of international development studies, there were students in nursing. So they look for a wide range of students with um, a lot of international experience, but they also open it up to domestic people with do domestic experience. The microphone? Okay, sorry. So um, my global health experience, um, I was a peer HIV AIDS educator in Arusha, Tanzania for about two years. And I also worked, I volunteered in an orphanage in Ethiopia um, that cared for AIDS orphans for about six months. Um, I have a master's degree from Columbia University in International Affairs. And for the past seven or eight years, I was um, a board member for a HIV AIDS support and education NGO in St. Croix in the US Virgin Islands. Um, but I was focused on developing a, a business. I was in the private sector, but I, I kept that public health, um, my passion, interest, still going by volunteering in my community in the US Virgin Islands. Um, and now I'm working at uh, USAID as an intern. I mean, it's, it's all over the place, but just to say that your p public health experience domestically as well as internationally, I think, contribute to, to what they're looking for as an intern. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's a question specifically like about one type of experience I can talk because they're, they're just varied. They're varied experiences, so. No, I think that's um, interesting, and yeah, no, I think that you're you hit it right on the money. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, I was gonna pat, uh, see if Laura had anything to add. Sure. Um, so I kind of fell into global public health accidentally. Um, I had graduated college, uh, moved back to Philadelphia, and. Um, uh, a friend of mine was already in this group and their French translator for a trip to Senegal uh, dropped out and I had minored in French so I found myself on a plane going to Senegal to help out with this group that was um, mostly pre-medical students and, uh, and the nurse who runs the entire program. Uh, so while I was there, I found it really frustrating actually to be stuck in just the translator role and not be able to help anybody or do anything on the, on the health side. Um, so that kind of inspired my journey, I suppose, into global health. Um, I became much more involved in the organization. I ended up uh, working at Penn and then starting to go to school there um, for global health. And, uh, and I had already started those classes when I went on my next trip, which was to Haiti. And it was relatively shortly after the earthquake. Um, I was surrounded by doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners and other medical professionals who were involved in um, working with a Haitian doctor and nurse that we were friends with to set up a clinic and provide primary care and also referrals to, um, to more specialized care if needed. Uh, but what frustrated me was seeing how we were passing out vitamins like candy to everybody because everybody was malnourished and the, the Haitian nurse that I was talking with was saying, yeah, this is always a problem. Like people are living on like, you know, donations of rice and, and have no access to fruits and vegetables. Um, and I, you know, looking at that from a public health perspective, I suppose, I, I thought that it was kind of silly that we were coming down here every few months and handing out vitamins and what do people do once those run out. So uh, the gentleman whose house we were staying at, he runs a, um, uh, a program through the Life is Good Foundation. It's a private company, Life is Good, and he runs one of their locations where they do children's programming. And I was talking to him and it turned out, you know, he felt the same way that people's access to food um, was a big problem that, you know, needed some work in this neighborhood. And so we worked together to start an urban garden program. He luckily had lots of land and that's kind of rare. Um, he owned this land and had the opportunity to, um, work with us and some of our volunteers 
in creating a, a garden, and he came from a farming background, so he's able to continue it while we're gone. He doesn't rely on anything but the money that we send. Um, so I think that was a, a really satisfying experience, probably my first really, you know, feeling like I had done something effective in global health. And uh, since then, I've gone back to Senegal a couple times, haven't had the opportunity to go back down to Haiti, although I'm hoping to this summer. And that's it. I'll defer. I have a very boring story, so I'll defer. <laughs> <laughs> These guys heard mine ad nauseum. <laughs> Um, okay, what uh, benefits and challenges um, have you um, witnessed uh, either students going through your program um, or um, just typical challenges and um, benefits do students experience while they are working or doing global health work? Um, I'll just try and speak to my experience as a GHFP intern. So. Um, because that's why I'm here, and not so much my own personal experience. But if you all have questions after, I'd be happy to answer it. Um, so the benefits of being a GHFP intern are enormous. Um, I have a little bit more mature than the average student in terms of age. I don't want to say old, but <laughs> <laughs> I've just done a couple of things and had a, um, some internships at some larger international organizations. And there is a big difference um, between what GHFP offers and a lot of other regular internships. There's a lot of structure. Um, there is a lot of opportunities for professional development. There are brown bags periodically, both within USAID. There are daily brown bags about how to you know, uh, reconstruct your resume or tailor your resume. There are always people out there to help you. We have a coordinator at GHFP that's dedicated to us to help with our professional development and talk to us and find out what we're interested in beyond the internship period. There's incredible networking opportunities within USAID. Um, not only because it's, it's a large government agency, but because a, like a lot of government agencies, they do a lot of contract work out with implementing partners. And these are the people on the ground that are, are actually doing the on the ground work for, for USAID. At USAID and DC, like with a lot of federal agencies, they're the technical, the think tank. And so they, they, manage, mission, they manage projects and they manage stuff that's on the ground. But wh who is actually doing the implementation are these implementing partners, and I'm in um, family planning office, and so we do a lot of family planning, and the, the organizations that our division usually works with are uh, in gender health, FHIC, 360, and so th there's opportunities to network with these agencies as well. So it's not restrictive to whether you're considering working within the federal agency beyond the internship experience, but there's, in, there's plenty of opportunities um, outside of agency, which is really incredible because you have you get to to really branch out, which is which is key because ultimately that's what an internship is about. It's about networking and securing something for the future, and that there's that structure there. Um, second benefit of GHFP, unlike other internships, it pays. Mm -hmm. So I know you know speaking as a student, I speak very you know openly with you all and honestly that that's you know that's a big plus. Living in DC is not it's not easy, you know, and so they they compensate you. Um, the challenges, I mean, there's a lot more benefits to that, but I don't want to hog up the time. Um, I'll just say one of the challenges of working with a large federal agency is it's a large federal agency. So, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you have to maneuver within that, it's not just as, you know, and, and there are reasons for that. I'm not just saying that just as a knee-jerk reaction. You know, you just can't have an idea and it'll be the greatest idea. There's a lot of steps you have to go to get to a certain place. And in other places, in other smaller organizations, that's not a challenge. So just figuring out what the mechanisms are, how things work, it's a little bit of a learning curve. When you first get there, there's a lot of acronyms thrown around. You know, um, so, so that's a challenge working with federal agency. But overall, it's, it's an amazing experience. So I really encourage you all to apply, and I'm speaking very honestly. OK, um, I guess I'll talk about it more from the perspective of going abroad and doing one of these medical mission type of things. Um, so in terms of the benefits, I think it's really useful when you're a student to, uh, you know, be able to go on one of these short-term trips because the trips that we offer are about one to two weeks uh, due to student schedules and professional schedules and things like that. Um, I think it's useful as a student to be able to go and uh, explore if this is something you really want to do with your life. A lot of people might think, yeah, I want to join the Peace Corps, I want to go work abroad. It's probably important to get some more short-term experience in that field before you go and do that. 
um, benefits are huge. You know, the satisfaction you get from seeing a project that you're working on is starting to work, um, which might take a long time depending on what intervention you are working on. But even if you're just able to see uh, how, you know, for instance, a clinic has helped a, a patient with, um, you know, with hypertension get access to medication. Um, if you're watching, you know, little kids help Ishmael, our friend who runs the garden. If you look at pictures and see them, you know, picking the corn and all the vegetables that they're growing, like that's a wonderful thing to experience and be a part of. Um, but there are challenges, of course, anytime you're working in another country. Uh, first of all, on these sorts of trips, you're, you're thrown in with a bunch of people um, from the U.S. or, you know, from a Western country where you uh, might not know each other very well and you are living and working with each other 24-7. And um, so you do really get to experience uh, team dynamics and, um, and figure out how to work with people who might come from different perspectives and, um, and things like that. Uh, other challenges are just you might be dealing with different bureaucracies. Um, we have our own in the U.S. Nothing's easy here. But when you're trying to implement projects in other countries, it's even more difficult because you're not familiar at all. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's all I can think of right now. <laughs> so um, benefits, I mean, those are everybody is familiar with the benefits. I won't go into detail about those. If you're in this room, then obviously you've, you've uh, come across the benefits at some point, thought, this is what I really want to do. I either want to save babies or I want to help people, you know, get over HIV or, or you know help their make their lives easier whatever I mean we all have our own benefits whatever we all what we take out of it at the end one one thing though that I do like to talk about and address in groups like this are the challenges and one challenge in particular especially to people who are looking at getting into global health or um, supporting their if you've already started your career and you're going coming back to to get further education or what have you, is, is and, and you hit right on it as well, this international, the, this concept of international experience and getting that. That's something when we, when I speak with people all the time, it's asked of, you know, how do I get this international experience? How do I, how do I prove myself or support myself as a global health professional um, if I don't have the financial ability or the, the time, the, 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 chronological ability is that a phrase can I use that I don't have the the time to go out and just quit whatever I'm doing and and, and do these things and, and you definitely hit on you know some of the short terms uh, the short-term commitments are, are much easier and 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 in a way to to get those uh, get that experience but one thing that we've seen in our field over the past two or three years that I think is just absolutely fascinating um, is that we we've seen a, a switch from this phrase of international experience to this concept of um, resource challenge setting and have have any of y'all have you seen this come across this yet this you've seen it in the last two or three years in scopes of work that this come up and so to me this is an absolutely fascinating concept and 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 it is a challenge to get that experience but I love this phrase of resource challenge setting and simply what that means is have you done this type of work before in any sort of situation where it, the, the the resources are limited. So we have those, in, and there are three main areas in the United States domestically that we have resource challenge settings. The first are um, inner city urban areas, right? So you, there are lots of global, or not global health, but lots of public health clinics or public health type of work in areas that are um, infrastructurally challenged, they are financially challenged. I mean, we go anywhere and there's financial challenges, especially at the tail end of this recession that we've just got out of. Um, so there's that. So this is these inner city settings. The second are, uh, and we're not too far from it, the Appalachian region. Um, very resource challenge setting. Uh, we encourage a lot of people to go check, you know, a lot of people will, I've spoken, I say a lot, three or four people I've spoken to have taken their summers and, and gone to West Virginia and volunteered at a clinic there. Just because a lot of the, the challenges that you face there are, are very similar to the challenges you would face in most developing nations. And the third are American Indian uh, reservations, which are pretty much the same exact sort of situation. And so um, those I really like to, when we come across challenges, like I said, I think one of the biggest challenges people mention are how do I, you know, if I don't have the money, if I don't have the time, how do I get this international experience in global health? And that's something I really like to, to push and encourage and tell people about. Like I said, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. So I don't know if that answered the question or not, but hopefully it did. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't make myself look like a complete fool. <laughs> Do you mind if I just jump in for one second? So kind of piggybacking off of that idea that like a student might not have the financial or time ability to go abroad, 
Um, I just finished doing one of my classes for my program, which was a global health immersion. And most people do choose to go abroad. I work full time. I couldn't take the time off to do that. Um, so I was able to find an organization in Philly that I could volunteer with. They work with um, they work with immigrants and asylum seekers and refugees. And so there are many opportunities within Philly with. Uh, that group, which was the Nationality Service Center, and many others that do global health work within the city. So, yeah. Dr. Larson, did you want to say? Well, the, the benefits, I think, are, are fairly clear in that, um, like, like I indicated, if you talk to some of the leaders in global health today, like Paul Farmer or you know, Michelle Barry or um, Dick Garant um, down at uh, Virginia, uh, these are people who are legend in global, they'll tell you, there was a moment when I as a student went abroad and it just crystallized for me and uh, the rest was history. And, and so there's a huge, you know, and that's how people are guided in developing their career interests and trajectory. So on the one hand, it's incredibly important. On the other hand, you know, how to go about getting that experience is, is a challenging one um, for resource reasons. Many people are dissuaded from doing it. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the mentoring piece, I just hope that you guys, you know, think about the mentoring. Um, we are fortunate to want to go out of the country to do good, um, but sometimes we can overstep our mm -hmm. our legitimate way, you know, place. Um, and, and so you, you want to think about all of that. You want to talk to people, um, get their impressions, their ideas, people who've been out there um, doing global health work um, get their input as students to find out how you can maximize the experience. Surprisingly, when I send students out of the country, I tell them, listen, you know, if you've never been, and I grew up in South Jersey, so I never even made it past the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> um, you know, to, to, if you've never traveled in a developing country to understand about running water, to understand about, you know, what foods you can eat, you can eat safety, um, being in an under-resourced environment, then just exploring that as a passive observer is sometimes equally valid as going down with a stethoscope or you know, a, a lesson plan. Um, there's so many different ways to early on gauge whether um, the fact that you don't have running water or hot water or food that you're accustomed to is really going to turn you off. I mean, you'll never know unless you go. So sometimes, not even in the structured environment of a course, just finding an opportunity to, to put yourself in that environment. And again, you don't need to go out of the country. Put yourself in a West Philadelphia school system, you know, helping a teacher run a class, and decide for yourself whether or not you want to get that close. Because for some people, it can become very uncomfortable um, when you leave your comfort zone. Um, so. You know, by, by, by challenging your assumptions and, and, and you can benefit immensely. Um, and early on at the undergraduate level, come up with some ideas about who you are and why this is you know, important to you. Um, will you all share with us um, uh, what you know now, uh, what you know now <laughs> wait, that you wish you knew then? I always get that mixed up. but. Um, knowing what you know now, um, what did you wish you knew then, before, after I, your experience? I'll just be very straightforward. Um, I wouldn't trade any of it for anything. I mean, it's all added to who I am today. And if you um, if you bypass that experience just because it's written in a textbook, you kind of did yourself a disservice. So I wouldn't change any of it. Just get your pack and get going. <laughs> Kendall, Laura? I'm, I, need, I need to think a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, you know, just thinking back to my earliest experiences going abroad, um, I would say that, uh, you know, change is slow, and if you're working on a project in a different country, um, whatever intervention it is, it might feel like at times what you're doing is just a small drop in the bucket and that it's not really contributing to any major overarching changes. Um, but just remember that change is slow and I think the longer you spend in the field of global health, the more you will see how your small contributions really contribute to something bigger than you. Um, so again, what I'm talking about is just my Global Health Fellows internship experience. I just want to all give you a taste of that. Uh, 
And when I've gone to career panels, and um, what I found to be the most helpful is people being honest. <laughs> and so I'm going to try and be honest with you all. I agree with what everyone's saying. You know, if this is what you want to do, there are no regrets. International experience, it's just on a personal level, it's life changing. You know, just just opening your eyes to somebody else's experience and living through that. It's, you know, we can't, I, I don't think we can underestimate to, to you all um, the importance of that. But um, what I wish I had known before applying for the internship is the security clearance process is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know if you all have ever tried to apply for federal government clearance. And I'm a research intern. I mean, I'm looking at published data. You know, I mean, like, there's no top secret stuff in what I do. I mean, anyway, whatever. But it's if you, if you're interested in this internship, you know, you are required to fill a crazy, crazy form. It's not crazy. It's good. I mean, it's what the, <laughs> <back track>. it's, <laughs> but it, it it just threw me off. You know, compared to other internships, the the rigor that you have to prepare yourself. But but it's it's a great discipline. And so I wish that I had known that then, because you have to go back 10 years to your, you know, where you have lived for the past 10 years. And I don't know, can I say this? Because <laughs> it's okay to say. But it, it was just an immense process. And so that's what threw me up. And I wish I had known like 10 years ago to keep all my lease forms before I moved. <laughs> just things like that, it just logistics. So, so if you're interested, there, there is that, that portion of, of the application, which, which is a bit intense. So just being honest. Thank you for being honest. Anybody else want to share your thoughts? I'll say the reason I had to think about the answer, what, what do I wish that I know now that I, see I'm getting mixed up too. What do, I, what do I know now that I wish I knew before I had an international experience? And the answer is, for me at least, I've never had an international experience. I am that guy. Um, I've had my domestic resource challenge setting, a lot of that experience. And so I actually was telling Salam over the past couple of weeks, I'm actually at the end of the year having my first international experience. Uh, I'll be going to Latin America for like eight months um, to travel around and really get kind of what you said, put my pack on and go. Um, so I will hopefully see you all guys, see you all in a year and let you know what I wish I knew now <laughs> that I don't know or whatever, however it goes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what would you want students to know before they get involved um, in uh, global health work? So um, I, I can speak from my physician hat, and one of the alarming things that I see and hear is undergrads, for instance, going on medical missions to remote areas where, for instance, a dentist doesn't exist, and being, you know, the see one, do one, teach one mentality, um, which I was trained in in doing spinal taps and central lines. But to teach that to an undergrad who's not credentialed in any manner as a healthcare provider on how to extract teeth, uh, I mean, that's an extreme situation, but you'll find as undergrads and even pre-professionals being put in situations where you're pressed into service. And it's a very uncomfortable place for many of you, and many of you perhaps won't even think about it as, you know, you'll just go along for the ride. And, um, and that can be pretty unsettling uh, for me as a practitioner and the credentialing process I go through and learning healthcare delivery. So. Uh, what I'm getting at is in a developing under-resourced area, you may be the person asked to deliver that baby or do something that you're really not trained for. And um, you can't accept dual standards. And you have to ask yourself, what would I be allowed to do here in the United States? Um, I hear from many students, oh, I got to go and extract a tooth or sew up a laceration. And, well, what? <laughs> and that's, that's as a first year med student or even a second year med student who hasn't even had a clinical experience just because they're the doctor. So be careful when you go abroad that you don't overstep your boundaries. And, and sometimes I tell the students, you're just the backpacker. You're just the observer. You're just there to learn. Someday maybe you can bring resources to bear. So anyway, that's the caution for the students. Um, for me, what would I what would I want students to know before they seek global health work? Um, I think my, sorry, um, I guess my biggest advice would be, and this kind of goes in my personal life philosophy as well, but um, it's not 
it's very, I know you guys have heard this a million times before, but it's not a destination. It's not, it's not about where you end up. And so we, we speak to a lot of people, a lot of our interns as well are kind of trapped, I would say, by this track of, so I've graduated undergrad, now I have to go to grad school, and then I've got to get this experience, and then now I've got to have this job. And so we, you know, I do a lot of uh, informational interviews, a lot of resume reviews, and I always ask people, what's your one-year plan, what's your five-year plan? And so they'll, most of the time, their five-year plan consists of they're 23 years old and they want to run an entire project you know, in the next five years or whatever, which is great, and I hope they get it. But they, a lot of people, myself included, just get trapped into this, I've, I've got to do this, and I've got to do that, and I've got to have my experience. And so my biggest advice is, don't get trapped into that. Enjoy it. You know, if you're overseas, enjoy it. Enjoy that moment. I mean, don't live on the beach, but do what you're, do, you know, going there to do. Be the backpacker. Be the if you have the chance to assist, then assist. But definitely, I totally agree with you. Not going over, you know, pulling a tooth when you're, you know, in undergrad. Um, we have heard horror stories like that as well. Um, I'm sure they're rampant. Um, but yeah, I mean, just in, enjoying that moment. Um, and, and really going with the flow. And the other thing, again, this getting trapped thing is, is people, when we look at resumes, when we're talking to our interns and we're asking them again, what do you want to do? And they say, well, I don't know, I've got experience in this and I've got experience in that, and, but I've got to figure out what I want to do because I, you know, I'm, I've, I've got to nail it down because nobody wants a generalist. They, you know, I have to be a specifist. And so, have you guys heard that before? Be a specifist, not a generalist, right? And so the, it, it can be very incredibly overwhelming. What am I going to do? I don't know if I want to, what side? And really explore it. I mean, our biggest advice is explore it, explore it, explore it. I mean, there, there is no time like the present. And I know that's like very hippie-ish and all of that, but there, there isn't. There, there absolutely, this is the time to, if you're abroad, explore the different aspects. If you don't know if you want to do infectious diseases, infectious diseases or dental health or if you want to be more on the side of like monitoring and evaluation or you know policy evaluation explore all of those aspects of it um, it's incredibly incredibly I think incredibly important to do that and so that's what I would I would really recommend to anybody is to use this time that you have now to explore and not to lock yourself into something just because it fits best on a timeline or it's it's easiest for you at this moment really play with it um, I guess I just have one piece of uh, practical advice that I feel like is really important, and that's the idea of um, language study. So I think it makes a really big difference if your goal is to be able to go to a different country and work with other people within that country. I do think it's really important to at least at a basic, hopefully proficient level, be able to communicate in one of their own languages. Um, I know that's been that's been really helpful for me when I've gone to West Africa with this group or when I've gone to Haiti. And while I don't speak um, Haitian Creole, I do speak enough French that I could communicate easily with a lot of the doctors and nurses and other educated people who did speak French. Um, you do get a different experience if you're doing global health and you are able to communicate in a person's own language. So, um, you know, given that you guys are maybe global health students already, that might be something you've already done or are doing. Uh, but if you haven't taken Spanish since high school and you're thinking about doing some global health in the future, maybe try to pick that back up again, because I do think it makes a big difference to be able to communicate with, uh, with the folks that you're working with. Um, just, sure. Um, again, speaking through the, the lens of an intern, um, with my own personal experience as a student, so maybe some of you all can relate to that. Um, but, you know, Traveling internationally, I just can't say how much that helps. And not only does it help to, you know, further your resume and all those things that matter to getting a job, but it, you know, it's a life-changing experience and it helps you articulate that passion because global health is not, you know, it's not a high-paying job, you know, unless you're the director of USAID or Global Health Bureau. I mean, I'm, there's limits to where you can go with the pay grade. And knowing that, developing a real passion, you know, and being able to articulate that to yourself, that this is something that you want to do, will just really be very helpful to you because it's not a glamorous job, you know what I mean? But you all know that. But you know, knowing that, and but and coming with something genuine too, and and I think that international experience helps really solidify whether you want to put yourself in this position for, you know, develop a career in really helping millions of lives at a time, you know. And that, to me, is, it's, 
I, you know, the international experience uh, has really convinced me that this is what I want to do, and I'm able to articulate that to myself and convince myself, you know, that this is a career that I want to develop. Thank you. Um, and now is the time I'd like to open it up uh, to our audience. Um, for anyone who has a question, I will come to you. Just wave. Yep. Good morning. Um, my question is just as um, in regards to like the application process. I know you touched on it, Salam, but like about how long does the application process take, what qualifications you're looking for. So that's my question. Exactly. Um, well, I can give you this, the, my experience, and then he can tell you the nuts and bolts because <laughs> he knows what they're looking for, and I'm just telling you what I think. So the application um, process for the internship, and, and I think maybe the fellows program also might have some similarity to it. It's a bit rigorous, you know, there's, there's steps to it. It's not, I applied to some other internships, internship programs with some pretty large organizations. It was just submit a resume. That simple. This one is a little bit more involved. You, there's, there are short essay questions that you have to, to answer. I think the deadline is February, early, late January, early February. So it's, it's a, you have to start thinking about these things. Now you have to get uh, recommendations. So it's a pretty involved internship process, but they do that for many reasons. You know, they want to have a high caliber, not that I am, but, you know, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean that, you know, but they're looking for a certain type of applicant who'd have the patience and the dedication to go through something like this. And then after that point, if you, if you, you know, Kendall will elaborate on this, if you get to a certain stage and they approve that and it goes to the next level, it goes to um, the division of the bureau that you apply to. So I applied to the Office of Reproductive uh, Population Office of Population and Reproductive Health within that research utilization. They, they, they um, have a website, which Kendall will talk about, with detailed descriptions of scopes of work, basically a description of what the internship involves. And there's, there's a number of them, and I think you can apply to two or three at a time, but you'd have to, with it, if you apply to two, you have to fill out an additional set of essay questions relating to that position. Um, once you're ma if you get through that process and you're matched and you have a phone interview and then so you know, can talk about it, but it's it's a pretty involved application, you know. But it's it's a good discipline to do those kind of things. It sharpens your writing skills, but it also helps you decide whether you really want to do this thing, you know, because it asks you basic questions. What? Why are you passionate about global health? And you have to sit and think about it, <laughs> and that's a really good exercise for you personally, whether you get to the next process or not. I mean, those kind of questions were very helpful to me. I think Salam hit the nail on the head, yeah. If you, um, I'm more than happy to go over more specific nuts and bolts uh, after if you want. I don't want to take time up here to do it, because I'm sure everybody's like, I don't want to hear that, but definitely we can talk about the nuts and bolts. Um, I know the second part of her question was just about qualifications. I think um, Laura talked a little bit about, you know, just knowing a language, but sometimes, you know, maybe you don't have to know a language, but maybe what are some qualifications um, because I think sometimes maybe people who are new to this uh, might be thinking, I love this, but I don't know if I'm qualified. To the Global Health Fellows Internship? Well, I was going to oh. say, um, maybe have Laura to talk oh, and then, sure. um, about some of the mentoring um, opportunities, the local things. Well, for, for us from, from ESF, it's a very small organization. And so basically, whenever we do have students who are interested, they, they submit a formal application. There are a couple essay questions you need to submit. I think it's two letters of recommendation. Include your resume, and there are also background checks involved, um, which is pretty easy. You go online and pay the state of Pennsylvania like 10 bucks, and they ensure that you've never been arrested for certain things. Um, and, uh, and so that's it. And then we invite you to come and interview a uh, couple of rounds of interviews with uh, Shanta Collins, who is a nurse practitioner who is the head of the organization, and normally with one or two other folks, just to make sure that you know you would be the type of person who could probably handle a trip abroad. If you know we need to kind of try to determine that as best we can, if you've never been abroad before, um, as well as would you fit the team dynamics? You know we need people who can manage to work and live and breathe together with a, you know, with a group of 10 or so other strangers or near strangers for a week or two at a time. 
Um, so I think for us, given that we are a smaller organization, the application process is not as intense as the fellowship program that you've described. Uh, but there are still definitely you know, certain qualifications you need to meet. Um, however, it's kind of more, I suppose it's more like amorphous. There's no cut and dry qualifications. Did you have anything to add, Dr. Wallerson? Um, so our organization is based in Philly and it is local. We draw students from Temple, Drexel, uh, PCOM, Haverford, Bryn Mawr, from Swarthmore, all over the university. So there are a lot of undergrads. Many of them um, come in as pre-meds or pre-professionals and um, they want to add something to their resume and not that we dissuade that and we can certainly understand that, but what we really have come to realize is that we need to shift the sort of axis and encourage people in, in a sort of more paternalistic way, uh, ways to explore the community. Um, we had, it, as an open operation, people could just show up for years um, as we were slowly growing and then when you get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers, you have to come up with a framework for them to participate. Many people of the volunteers wanted to become engaged in the clinical piece when they really don't have the clinical skill sets needed to function in a clinical environment. And, and so that kind of bottlenecks the volunteer stream. And we actually, we as, as a, an organization, sat down and thought about that in more details and took a model from the candy stripers of all things. So in our hospital, and in many hospitals, if you want to volunteer, for instance, in the emergency department, you may spend three months or six months pushing a cart around selling or you know, hawking magazines and books to the inpatients and sort of do your time and slowly um, move into a position of more and more responsibility, and, and which is often determined by your showing up and participating. Um, that's the candy striper model. So for us, what we're going to do, since we run all of these non-clinical programs, which we really believe are essential to understanding community engagement, is going to implement um, almost like a six-month externship where you have to do time in one of the programs and reflect on that. Um, and it's in a mentored capacity by the, the groups. We have about 20 students and, and residents that are the sort of core nucleus of the leadership. And those guys then oversee the different projects. And so we're going to restructure that, I think. And students will benefit from it more um, as they move along the path of their education. So it's a work in progress, but. And I saw a question. Yep. I had an opportunity um, to work with the um, Lakota Sioux a couple summers ago, and that's truly where my heart is. Um, and part of what I, I, I really couldn't believe is that these people are, what, what I did there was to build outhouses and um, uh, wheelchair ramps because the incident of diabetes is so great. Um, and I personally couldn't understand how people in the United States could use, could need outhouses. And you know, they didn't have money to build a well. They didn't have money to pay electricity to pump water. And I was amazed. So my heart is really out there to work. Um, I guess my question is, is um, I love the organization that I worked with because they were, um, they actually worked within the community. They brought people in from the community to the, um, to our group to teach, to teach who the, the Lakota Sioux were and how their belief systems are and, and the purpose of it was to learn as opposed to for us to teach them. And uh, so, and I think that's, I came in late to your um, presentation, but I think that's where you were talking about, um, you know, not being the all white person coming in to rescue people. Um, so is there any organization that you know of that would be something that you would recommend to, other than the one that I know um, to work with the, uh, people like that? I mean, I know you had mentioned the American Indians, um, but 
can you? So there, there are tons and tons and tons of NGOs, both, you know, all over the planet. And I spent a lot of time um, in Guatemala, for instance, getting to know Nicaragua, getting to know some of those, and traveled before the internet, would get in a Jeep and just go over hill and meet tour sites and stuff to gain that. Um, to me, that's still essential. And, and you know, while there are 2,500 NGOs in Guatemala, I could probably give you one or two that I think would really give you that kind of experience that you're looking for. In Nicaragua, for instance, Axiom Medica Cristiana, you know, people that empowered the community to tell them, first off, what, you know, do they want? What do they need? What are their priorities? And then how we can partner with you to bring them on board and, and establish them and then serve as a platform for stakeholders and whether that's USAID or, you know, the local governments or, you know, non-denominational organizations or, you know, to, to bring those resources to bear where they have the impact. You, you got to sift around. You have to look and you have to invest time. Mm -hmm. But there are groups I could recommend to go start as a starting point. Yeah. I don't have um, groups either that I know off the top of my head for this specific niche, but I will kind of piggyback and say that I, and, and I think you hit the nail on the head, or at least from my perspective, I think, in that it's the piggy, there's a lot of, um, not piggybacking, there, there are a lot of, um, you, you might find opportunities not just looking at straight organizations, looking at their partners. So like the Bureau of Indian Affairs or um, state, um, like even local state departments in each state. So like, the, you know, right. So checking to see what activities they have, what programs, what projects they have, and who their working partners are. Um, is where we, we encourage a lot of people to, to check out for job opportunities, especially if they're really specific or if they're in tight little niches. Um, is to find, find or think of partners they may have, um, larger partners, federal government, statewide, other government agencies, um, uh, you know, in, internet like Latin American government agencies because they obviously also have indigenous populations, especially in South America. Um, so yeah, trying to see, and, and that might give you um, a broader access as opposed to trying to search for uh, an NGO that has 20 people that may not even have a website may be able to find their actions through their partners. So first off, thank you so much for your wisdom and, and uh, advice. Um, my, my question is, um, in your travels, how did you overcome a lot of uh, challenges or barriers that you had based upon cultural or socioeconomic differences to successfully implement you know, the, the programs that you were working on? Um, you, you ever been to the uh, amusement parks and you get on a roller coaster and all of a sudden you're strapped in and it's no, <laughs> in other words, you buy the ticket, you take the ride and you're going to get what you get and at the end of the ride you might decide I'm never going on that ride again, but you're on and you, for better or for worse, you're adaptable. That's one of the advantages you have in terms of higher cognitive function. You can rationalize, you can understand, you can contextualize all of that experience um, with the knowledge that at the end of that ride, I have some decisions to make. Um, so I, that's been my own personal um, experience. And I think that analogy was fantastic. But once you're in the country, you have no choice but to continue with your project, whatever barriers might pop up along the way. Um, and I think something that's helpful is going into, into any sort of travel abroad situation, knowing that you have to be incredibly flexible, that you might have this like perfectly planned itinerary and you know um, an idea for the way things are going to go, and it's not going to happen. Um, it will never go according to plan. And so one example I can think of is my last trip to Senegal. Um, an English teacher that we had worked with, he had been doing tutoring in this small village outside of where we were staying. And, uh, and he said, the people really, really, really want you guys to come out and just do a clinic day, uh, just so that they can get like the most basic health care, just super basic checkups and things like that. And so we said, okay, fine. We were packing up all of our stuff, and he got a phone call saying some village elder didn't want us to come out. He wanted to be a different day, and you know everything was going wrong. 
And, um, you know, luckily we had that friend, that contact who uh, was, he was a Senegalese man. He knew the language. He knew all of these village elders. And so he was able to kind of be our conduit to work around that barrier. Uh, so I think that's one of the best reasons, one of the, you know, there's so many reasons why you should be working with the populations that you're actually working with. Um, but I think, you know, having better access to overcoming barriers is one of them. So that's my perspective. Hi, I'm Suman. I'm undergrad from Haverford College. Um, the question I had is kind of directed to Dr. Larson. When you showed us the email from your student, um, I read the first line, then he smuggled in some medical supplies, and that was really bold and funny. Um, and the question I had is, like, what are your plans for the future? Um, like, I think, like, from what I imagine and from my understanding, you can only go so far without governmental help, without, you know, like monetary funding. Um, and I understand that you can do more, like, bold stuff like that if you're, like, non-governmental organization. But, like, what are your plans and what do you hope that government would do to support um, these issues? So um, for the population that I care for, um, because of the regional migratory patterns um, coming out of Mexico pr principally uh, in terms of labor force, you'll find um, when I worked in Kennett Square, um, all of the mushroom workers came from a couple of villages in Guanajuato, or near Guanajuato, Mexico. In the case of South Philadelphia, um, it's very interesting actually, in like 1998 I want to say, a guy was on his way, there's a large population from Puebla, Mexico living in New York City. And this guy was on his way, way to New York City and got lost. And uh, he wandered into a Mexican restaurant where one of my friends, David Soro, who is a part of Puentes, happened to be working. And looking, because he saw Cocina Mexicana, he said, I need directions to New York City. And David said, well, why are you going to New York City? There's work here. And pretty soon, he established a, a job. And then his cousin, his uncle, his brothers. And so in the village of San Mateo Zolco, uh, in Puebla, Mexico, um, out of 6,000 adults, 2,000 live in Philadelphia. And what you understand now is that there's a, a circle uh, that's constantly growing and there's a dynamics there. Things are in flux and um, there's a really ongoing unique opportunity to embrace the realities of migration or immigration and, and to improve not only outcomes on this side of the border, but on the other side of the border. And in, and in fact, examine, you know, what are the variables that lead a 16-year-old kid in the midst of high school in San Mateo Zolco to suddenly navigate 2,500 miles to come up here and be a busboy at Tequilas? You know, what are the variables? And you realize that it's about education, it's about opportunity within Mexico. So in that village, when you're 16, you have a decision to make. You either go out, because there is no cottage industry, there's no, no industry except agriculture, you either are going to go out and work the plot of land that your grandfather handed down to your father and it's being groomed for you to take over, and you subsistence exist, and that's going to be your life, and you're going to have a hard time putting food on the table for your children and growing families because the population grows, the land shrinks. Or you do something bold at 16 and you hop a bus and you go to, you know, north to the border and cross and come here. So understanding those dynamic forces that create the original movement and cycle going is, is essential. And it's not for me up here to look on that village and say, look, there's no health care in that village. And I, as a doctor, am going to down and help the Mexicans do it right. No, they have an institute of public health. They have Puesta de Saludes. They have an infrastructure. It's really over time for me to figure out how I can build a partnership. And it's the concept, again, of a north-south partnership where I'm not interested in sending my students down there per se. I would almost much rather have their, my colleagues from down there come up and we begin the dialogue of how we can partner to some degree, that's happening at the Institute of Public Health in Mexico, in Cuernavaca. And there's been a proposal uh, on the drawing board to build a binational health insurance plan that enables expats here to enlist primary care services from 
providers across the country. So, you know, th that requires a very bold initiative that crosses the border. It's not my idea. It's, you know, again, it's, it's about dialogue and building that partnership. So we're in the process of that. It's years down the road. Um, I mean, again, ideally, um, this both sides of the border kind of north-south partnership is the idea is the model. And then it gets sort of cross-pollinates. You go from Puebla to Michoacan or Puebla to Juarez. You, you know, you, you start creating, because if you look at the United States, it is a regionalized pipeline from one destination to another. Um, so why not look at Baja and where that population ends up in the United States and replicate the model? So, and then, you know, cross-pollinate amongst the Mex your Mexican colleagues. So that's the long-term vision. It's ways away. I mean, we get our physical space. That's our first big challenge. So. so my question is really directed to anyone. Um, and I was wondering, in your experiences internationally, how the indigenous populations actually receive your assistance? Um, specifically, how did their expectations for healthcare shape their treatments? Did they have an understanding of what treatment could be, what medication was, versus potentially a superstitious understanding of their condition? Well, I'll jump in and just talk about my experiences in, uh, in just these two towns, one in Senegal and one in Haiti. Um, I think in both instances, people were pretty, um, what's the word? Uh, they had a good understanding of medication and medicine. Um, we were in cities in both instances. We were not in tiny little towns in the boonies. And I think that makes a big difference. Um, in both instances, in Port-au-Prince and Haiti and in Chess, which is the city we were in in Senegal, um, people had had, uh, you know, run-ins with the medical system in the past. Um, they were familiar with the public hospitals and clinics and things like that. The issue is not so much an understanding of medicine. It's an issue of access, uh, at least in those instances where I was. Um, people did, you know, just purely anecdotally, people loved medication. They, they seemed really excited about getting any medicine. And in the clinics in Haiti that we would run, those kind of pop-up clinics where people would just, you know, that was an opportunity to get care that might not be there next week. So it would be lines out the door, down the block for like, you know, people waiting for four hours to get in. And even folks who were entirely healthy, like guys who would come in and be like, oh yeah, I had a headache last Tuesday. So we would give them like a little bit of Tylenol and some vitamins and that seemed to to, uh, like satisfy people who were coming in. They just wanted to take that opportunity to access whatever care they could get and whatever medication they could get. Um, but those are very specific instances. It's just one town in one country. And uh, so that's what I got. Um, I'll add something to that. Um, I was a HIV AIDS peer educator in Tanzania. So a lot of it was behavior change, which in my mind is really a cornerstone of public health interventions or getting, you know, changing people's behavior to you know, that's pr pretty much a lot of interventions involved that. And so th there was a lot of challenges, a lot of preconceived, I don't want to say cultural, but just, you know, misinformation about contraction of the virus, about use of contraceptive methods. Um, so it, it was personally challenging, but I think, you know, a huge part of public health and what we've all been stressing to you is not, you know, parachuting in and parachuting out. It's building those links with those communities and, you know, you, USA, I can't, I can't speak so much about my time at AID with this kind of, but I'll speak at what I was doing at the grassroots level. But building those partnerships with communities, sustainable partnerships, you know, and, and developing that sense of trust goes a long way to, to making your intervention effective, to making your time in that country, in that community, US or international, that much more effective, having that much more, you know, and, and just like not, you know, not just surface, you know, yes, we talked to so-and-so at the community and, and check that community participation box, but real, genuine community-based participatory involvement in the interventions is so key, you know, and that, that's my personal opinion and, on that. And, you know, along those lines, uh, early on, parachuting in was the only exposure you could get, and I stopped doing that um, in the mid-'90s, and, um, and by 2000, stopped altogether putting students in that environment. Um, not sure that that 
for me, that person philosophically wasn't where resources were going to go. And it's building the relationships with my colleagues in country who, when I leave, have to wrestle with the realities of being under-resourced. And yet, having access to the New England Journal online, but knowing that that's a, ma you know, that's a level of care that is exceeds their capacity. And so um, giving them, just in solidarity, my willingness to come down and lecture and my willingness to bring them up here to allow them to explore our health system those are the that for me is i don't write i don't touch patients after the earthquake i did in haiti but i don't generally put myself in the position to be the care provider i just don't have the skill sets for that that i leave to my colleagues who are on the ground and and i think as a result of that sort of philosophical kind of decision, um, they respect me and uh, we have a very good understanding of, of, of education and you know they're, they're my peers in those countries educating the next generation of providers and so we can exchange ideas and their residents will come up here and I'll send my residents down there and it, it's an interaction of, of education and knowledge and trust. Not the delivery. I don't. That helps. I'll I'll jump in here real quick. I've already outed myself as not having international experience, but um, I I love your question, and the reason I really like it is because my own personal um, my own personal interests in global health are actually the 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 psychosocial cultural norms. That's that's what I love, and I find that absolutely fascinating. I've used that word a million times today already, but. Um, I just want to take it to a few quick seconds and say that there's a whole field um, dedicated to, to to answering those questions. So you know, I'm not so sure so much about the the what was the word you used? Um, you used uh, something um, spiritual or something about you know it's this superstitious. Yes, that's the word you used. I'm not sure so much about that, but they're definitely you know, like for Africa in Africa, for example, there's a huge cultural stigma against using condoms. I mean, just a major cultural stigma and for you know 20 years we've gone in and said we're the smart white people do what we tell you to do and you know and then you won't have this horrible deadly disease and now we're finally realizing over the past 10 years maybe that wasn't the best idea of doing it maybe we should understand their culture first and try to try to, to find a middle ground and um, that's what I love and, and I love that now there's an entire field it's not just like some little guy in a computer in a corner somewhere who's researching these things. There are entire fields of study and entire areas in USAID dedicated to people doing this. And we have four internships or had four internships last year out of 25, which is a large portion that are just their psychosocial cultural analysts. Like that's what they do. They, they go in and they, so if that's something that interests you or anybody here, definitely there is work in it. And it's, it's such a newer field that they're, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a saturated market yet. And it won't be for years. And it's, anyway, it's, you can tell, or hopefully you can tell, it's a huge, strong passion. Like, so I encourage you, check it out. It's awesome. It's, it's amazing. It's smart. Um, so my question is about master's in public health programs. Um, and it's kind of a two-tiered question. My first question is kind of a chicken and egg question. And so I would like to get an MPH. And I was wondering, a lot of the MPH programs require at least two years of service in the health field. And so, but I would like to be able to at least have an education and provide a skill set to the communities I'm working in. But at the same time, um, a lot of these programs, I would like to use my, I guess, experience to inform my education and use my education to provide a skill set. And so, sorry, um, my first question is, do you have a perspective on which is the better path to take? I'll just answer that as a current student um, and be honest again and say, um, not to plug my school, but they have a really great degree. It's called the Masters of Science of Public Health. It's a two-year program, and unlike other master's programs, it does not require that two-year requirement. Um, so look into it, because you might qualify to apply if you want to go straight from undergrad to grad. There are, of course, you know, eligibility requirements, but there isn't that two-year work requirement. And there are people at, people in that program tend to be a younger cohort. Um, and, and they do look at education experience and, and voluntary work as well. So 
consider that um, on a personal level, though, work experience is really helps you. Whether you want to take that time and just you know just speed through and go through a master's program, my my own experience is that that that's real experience, and that really within that time you might decide I don't want to do a master's for me, I want to you know do something else. So I say don't be dismissive of 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 taking that route because you might have a life changing experience. But if you wanted to do you know the Bloomberg School has a master of science program. If I can jump in on a, I have two answers, a philosophical and a realistic answer. So philosophical, which I mentioned earlier, I'm a huge believer in play with it. You know, don't just get stuck in your trap, right? That's what, don't just play with it. See what you like. See what you're interested in doing. So that's the philosophical, and I'm done with that. Um, now the realistic portion. Uh, we see, we see a fair number of people that will do kind of, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm making an assumption here. My assumption is that you're currently an undergrad? And yeah. You're, okay, and so you are looking at actually just, that was the question, to going straight to the MPH, right? With, I'm not really sure which one I want to sure. do first. Um, so we have um, we have several people that, and we've, we've worked with several people that will do that. And, and we've actually had three that have gone straight to PhD. And now they, you know, they're 28, 29 years old, have a PhD, but have absolutely no experience. And so they're, they're stuck. They don't know, you know, we have an intern this year who absolutely has no idea. They can't find a job because it's that, that overqualified thing, you know, and he has a million dollars in student debt, but doesn't have the experience. And so, you know, for me, realistically, it's my recommendation is always, don't get stuck in this trap. You know, get your experience. Know what you're doing. Yes, a uh, a graduate degree is very important to have. I mean, it's it's incredibly. But don't do it just because it's time to do it. Do it because you know that you absolutely that's what you want to do. And I think the only way to actually know that is to get in the field and have said, oh, I've done this. For and months. getting back to the how I started my lecture, um, Mondrian didn't paint Broadway boogie woogie out of a. 30 minute course that some guy taught him, right? You evolve to that and, and that should be, as an artist or as any professional, it's a process of trial and error and growth. And there's no substitute, I personally, to, to, to that experience. It really enriches you and it helps define who you are as an individual and, and your career trajectory, your vision. Just, obviously some people, you know, are driven to a point, but it, it, the, the process is actually one that um, I think in the long term will benefit your career. So. And uh, I'm also a current MPH student, and I wanted to add that um, my work experience before I came in uh, was enough to count as being two years of health experience, but it was uh, geriatrics research, and so not at all related to what I actually want to study. Um, so I guess my point with that is, is that any job that you have after college, after school, regardless of what it is, um, will teach you skills that I think are translatable. Um, for instance, when I was working in research, we learned a lot about ethics and, uh, you know, and respecting patient privacy and things like that, which are really important when you're going potentially to these other countries where there is nobody looking out to make sure that you are treating these patients ethic ethically. Um, it's all on you to make sure that you're doing that. So, and I just think any job that you have after school will possibly or probably um, be relatable to what you end up studying and will also teach you kind of where your passions actually are. So let me chime in real quickly. How many Drexel MPH students are in the audience? Um, <laughs> that'll give you some folks to talk to whether you decide to go straight through or uh, whether you decide to work for a while. I think our degree program at, and the way the MPH is designed at Drexel is we kind of give you the best of both worlds, the classroom and the practice. So our students end up leaving with not just the theory, but because the way our, the way our curriculum is developed, you get some experience along the way. Um, so please feel free to talk to any of those students about the Drexel MPH. And we do have materials, uh, from what I understand, outside about our MPH as well as our Global Health Certificate. Uh, that we offer. So let me thank the panelists um, and students. Please don't leave yet because we do have some raffle items that I believe Kate, is Kate still here? 
Kate's going to wrap off some items. We gave you those red tickets, but thank you to our panelists. Let me just say a couple things. Hopefully you see uh, somebody here on the panel that you will want to go up uh, when uh, Fee wraps up and, and talk to. We have Dr. Larson, obviously, who is uh, running an organization here in Philadelphia where you can volunteer and get, get some experience working with immigrant populations. Uh, Kendall and, and uh, Salam are from a national global health fellows program uh, that offers both fellowships and internships. And then Lara, obviously being from ESF, um, they have volunteer opportunities. So we tried to design this panel in a way where everybody who attended would be able to see somebody on the panel that they could talk to afterwards and maybe understand more about experiences that would be valuable to them. So again, thank you to our panelists and Fee will wrap up and then Kate will uh, give out these raffle prizes. Um, okay, not sure what I need to wrap up because I thought you did a pretty good job, Warren. <laughs> but you know what, I got goodie, I, I have gifts for our panelists and um, I'd just like to second that. Thank you so much um, for sharing your experience with us today. And um, uh, before you leave, um, we are gonna take a break before I think the next stuff happens. Um, but Kate, the next panel at one o'clock.